So every year, at the end of it, I like to make my top 20 game of the year list. After the first good game comes out, usually at least one in January, I start up my little document and begin to compile all the good games I play that year, and then I have to sit on it for 12 damn months till the end of December when I can release it in complete celebratory fashion. Well, I'm sick of waiting. I want to talk about good games and I want to do it now. So as of the month of August 2022, these are the best five games I've played so far, in no order, to preserve the surprise of the impending complete top 20. Some of them might fall out of the top 5 by the end of the year, something new might take their place, who knows, it's all very exciting. So number 1, which isn't necessarily number 1, Elden Ring. I know, you're shocked. Elden Ring is so talked about that speaking any additional words on its behalf just feels automatically derivative. The attention has died down somewhat, but holy hell dude, the heyday was crazy. Elden Ring just took over the gaming industry for like a month, which is impressive for a subgenre that's deceptively not that popular. I feel like nobody actually needs further explanation on why this game is good, so let's just move on. Number two, which isn't necessarily number two, Horizon Forbidden West. I know I'm trying to be kind of ambiguous about the order of things, but this game and Elden Ring really are the only competitors for the number one and number two slots, in my opinion, and I don't see anything else upcoming this year unseating them, except maybe God of War Ragnarok. Forbidden West is so much better than Zero Dawn, it's ridiculous. Like, every aspect of it is better. And as someone who experienced chronic open-world fatigue for quite some time beforehand, Forbidden West helped break me out of it just in time for Elden Ring. It really is tragic that this game launched a week before Elden Ring, and then people clowned on it retroactively for being too traditional with its mission structure and points of interest and map icons and whatnot after they became smitten with Elden Ring's habit of deliberately hiding everything from you. They were like, this is how you do an open world game, and then they gleefully trotted aimlessly around the map doing perimeter checks for 90 minutes at a time looking for cave openings and dungeon doors. Each game's got their strengths and weaknesses, and I don't like Horizon Forbidden West slander for the sake of it. They're both fantastic games. Number three, which isn't necessarily number three, Neon White. This is what a perfect speedrunning FPS looks like. The premise is simple. Kill all the demons in a level and finish it as fast as possible. Rinse and repeat over a hundred times while it never gets old and in fact only gets better. Neon White is an absolute banger from top to bottom. It's the only game I've ever given a 100 out of 100 in the fun category of my game graph reviews because it simply never stops being fun. These other two games have their moments, and they have plenty of moments, but Neon White is the moment. It has become the moment. I listen to its soundtrack on the regular, and I never do that with games. If you think you might like it, try it. I didn't really get what was going on when I watched the announcement trailer, but once it's in your hands and you're the one doing stuff, it's intuitive as hell. I played it for 30 seconds and immediately was just like, oh, oh hell yeah, dude, okay, I get it. Number four, which isn't necessarily number four, Rogue Legacy 2. I'm going to have to come back to this game and really give it another shot now because I spent the bulk of my time with it back when it was in early access, and they would reset your upgrades every couple weeks as they drop new patches and rebalance things, and I eventually got sick of that and just thought I'd wait till it was done. Well, now it's done, and the 34 hours I put in it were all very enjoyable. Rogue Legacy 2 has absolutely mastered the art of looping progression. As a roguelite, the castle resets with every death, but there are so many different strings to pull on in order to get permanent boosts and upgrades to your character and facilities. You got stat boosts, trait bonuses, weapons and armor, individual XP for every type of class, gold to spend on even more upgrades. You're just always doing something meaningful and getting stronger. Tons of play styles, tons of spells, just a super meaty game and one of the best this genre has to offer. Number five, which isn't necessarily number five, Pokemon Legends Arceus. This game immediately caught people's attention for how different it was from your usual Pokemon game, and I found it to be one of the most compelling from a completionist aspect. I might be too lazy to actually be a completionist sometimes, but this game made me really want to catch them all and fulfill all the Pokedex objectives to fully register them. You catch so many Pokemon in this game, I'm surprised there's any left. A dozen concurrent players could hunt the entire species to extinction. Trainer battles actually take a backseat in Legends Arceus and focus more on the expeditions. It feels different and it feels good. It doesn't run very well or look particularly impressive, but at the end of the day, Pokemon is still Pokemon and the things they do right tend to overshadow the things they don't. According to my analytics, 80% of you aren't subscribed. Why not make that number a little bit less embarrassing for me and stick around for more of my phenomenal content? Follow me on Twitter at SunburnAlbino. Watch all my videos with three different lights in your room turned on, and I'll see you guys next time.